television slate on my Nintendo Entertainment System. <laughs> Yo, 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 yo. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Bugs Boney says, The two time! Back to back, 1993. 1994 blockbuster video gaming champion. A video gaming superstar, 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 superstar. The arena is wide open. Trickle in. Chris says, nice hair. Thank you. All right, we're going to wait like uh, just one more minute. Then we'll get started. Echo, 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 echo. Hello, 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 hello. Can anybody hear me? Hear me? Hear me? Hear 
Did you guys see that movie? Um, the actor's name, I can't remember right now. Uh, but this, this is a real life story where somebody was hiking in some canyon. I think it was in Arizona. And this boulder fell on his arm and he was pinned there. And I bet he was like, hello, hello, hello. James Franco, that's right. Look it up. Actually, don't. It's, that's a disturbing piece of film. Okay, guys. Uh, I'm going to get started here. Now, I let you know via an, an announcement on UB Learns that because we have, I, I have um, a 334 lecture right at 1 p.m., and I need to set up for that. We're going to duck out of here a little bit early. So we're going to wrap up today around 1245. And then... Um, actually, I usually don't have office hours on Fridays. Usually office hours are Monday, Wednesday, 3 p.m. But today, we're going to have like extra office hours at 3 p.m. But I'm going to use that time to finish up what we... Don't finish today. So don't worry if you can't make it at three because every all these videos are going online to Twitch. But um, if you can make it back, you're welcome to join. And that's what, we'll be, that's what we'll be doing. Okay, so to start today, I want to recap a little bit. We started this um, example on Wednesday. And it's for designing a control system for this huge antenna, 60 feet in diameter. And this antenna is used to track satellites. So it needs to pan uh, across the sky to figure out the position of a satellite and, it's, uh, and all of that stuff. So we have a model for that, which we call the plant. It's a transfer function. And we're designing this feedback system to meet the following performance requirements. So we're tracking the azimuth angle, which is kind of like that horizontal angle. And so we're, we're usually going to be following a ramp reference as the the angle we need to track it moves in like a linear fashion across the sky. So we have three performance criteria. We want the overshoot to be less than 16%, settling time less than 10 seconds, and the steady state velocity error has to be less than 0 0.01 radians when we're tracking a 0 0.01 radian per second ramp reference signal. We talked about those performance requirements last time, what they physically mean, and we came up with a solution. We proposed these target closed loop poles right here. And then we designed a controller using the root locus method to give us those closed loop poles. And this was the controller. That's the transfer function. D of Z is 20.39 times z minus 0.5 over z plus 0.88. And once again, the sampling time for that is one second. Now, when you use this controller, you have three closed loop poles and we calculated what they are. Two of them are the target poles, which is good news. That's, that's the whole point of the root locus method that you can design a controller so that your closed loop system achieves the target poles. But uh, you're always gonna have or I won't say always, but a lot of times you're gonna have some extra poles left over that you have to deal with because this controller added one pole to the system. Like this is a second order system. Our controller made it now third order and we have three poles we have to keep track of. Now, looking at this closed loop pole, we found out there's one problem or there's two problems with it. Uh, one problem is that it exists on the negative real axis. And from our study of the behavior of discrete time roots, if you have a root on the negative real axis, it has a real jagged response. It oscillates 
kind of like this triangular wave with a frequency that is half of your sampling frequency. So our sampling frequency is one sample per, per second. So this is saying that once every two seconds, you're gonna have like this triangular wave completing a cycle. So it's it's not desirable and you'll see, yeah, when we simulate this later on, it, it really is not good news. Um, so it's on the negative real axis and it also dominates the target poles. When we say it dominates, that just means it's slower than the target poles. And all uh, what that means in terms of its complex plane position is that this pole is located farther away from the origin than our target poles. Like our target poles, I think they're like, if you draw a line, they're a distance of like 0.6 away. So this is 0.8 away. So it's a lot slower. It bottlenecks our performance time. Finally, we figured out that our static velocity error constant KV is 5.43, which is actually good. From our third performance requirement, we needed KV to be greater than one. And so we're like five times exceeding that. KV is related to your steady state error when you're tracking a ramp reference. So um, I think we calculated what the steady state error would be with this KV and it's like a thousandth of a radian. So it has pretty accurate pointing error, but there's other drawbacks. So we're not gonna go with this controller in the end. I'll tell you that much. Okay, but um, so we can deduce all of this about the controller's performance without looking at the actual simulation of its response. But the next step is to go into MATLAB, simulate this system, and let's see how it actually behaves as a function of time. And that's the topic of today. And it's also the topic of your homework six. six. So it behooves you to pay attention. I got a question. What if the input is a unit ramp response? We're going to look at the ramp response today. So the way we simulate this in MATLAB is we, well, there's lots of ways to do it, but I think a good way is to use LSIM. And this is the way the command works. Your output is equal to LSIM. And then the first argument, sys, this is your transfer function. U is your, um, reference signal. So I'm pulling this notation just from the MATLAB website. We'll use different, uh, variable names. And T is the time uh, over which you want to simulate. Jonathan says one way to simulate a ramp response is you could multiply your transfer function by effectively one over S, which is a step, and then use the step response on that. So then it's like one over S squared. That's right, Jonathan, but you gotta convert that to discrete time first. So you can't use S with this. So one over S in discrete time is Z minus one over Z, I believe. I'd have to double check that, but yeah. So you gotta do it in, it's not one over Z in digital. Okay. So first, like, so what I wanna do, I wanna go into MATLAB and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get right into it. This code that you're looking at, we built this on Wednesday. So we got the transfer function. This is what we use to calculate our closed loop poles, calculate KV. So this is all stuff we did last time. So we're gonna build on this and I wanna simulate my system 
and we're going to use LSIM to do that. Maybe I can pan this up a little bit. Okay. Hold on, I'm just pulling up my uh, cheat sheet over here. Okay. So there's three arguments to LSIM. Maybe I'll just rewrite like that generic. Uh, so it was like sys, uh, u, and t. So I, this is just like uh, to help me remember what we need to use it. So one of the things we're going to need is our system. And uh, if we're going to plot the output, we can use as our system the closed loop transfer function which we already derived up above, all right? Our input u to our control system is going to be our reference signal. So uh, we're gonna try a ramp, and I'm also gonna show uh, a step. So I'm gonna show you how to do both, okay? And then t is our time vector, and you know what, because we set our settling time, should be like 10 seconds, we designed it this way. I'm gonna go from like zero to 10 seconds. That's the time interval over which we're simulating this whole thing. So let's build the time vector first. All right, so I'm gonna have a variable t final, which is 10. That's my final time. And then I'm gonna build my actual time vector. It's gonna go from zero intervals of capital T, our sampling period, and it's gonna go all the way to T final. So easy as that, we build our time vector. And I'm gonna put a little apostrophe at the end here. And what that does is it transposes this vector. Like, without the apostrophe, this makes a row vector, but I wanna make it a column. Because I think columns work better with LSIM, if my memory serves me correctly. So all the variables I'm gonna make, I'm just gonna make them into columns. So we already have one of the three arguments that we have to send to LSIM done. Next, I'm gonna make my input. And we're gonna do two different types of inputs. Um, let's do a, so one of our inputs is going to be a step reference. Now, when you make your input using LSIM, it has to, it's gonna be a vector, and it has to be the same size and length as your time vector. So, um, the magnitude of this step reference, well, well, first, I'm gonna show you this command ones. The command ones in MATLAB makes a vector full of ones Max says, not to be pedantic, but isn't the output of DZ usually called U, the ramp signal, what we would usually, yeah, that's, that's correct. So we're gonna use R. All I'm saying is, uh, like when you go to MATLAB documentation, they'll tell you U. So I'm saying U for us is going to be a reference. So our input to our closed loop system, this is gonna be our step reference. And uh, a step is just a constant and I'm gonna make it the same size as T. And this is the way you can do it. You can say the amount of rows is the same as the length of T, which should just be 10, right? And then we have one column. But uh, the amplitude that I'm gonna use for this, I'm gonna make it like a small number like 0 0.01 radians. Remember the, the reference, like keep bringing back to your mind that this is a physical problem that we're solving. The reference is the desired azimuth angle. So we have this huge antenna, we're trying to point it at a certain angle. And so it's always good to keep this in your mind, like uh, even as you're doing this theoretical stuff. All right, let's make our ramp reference. So ramp is just a, a sloped line. And the particular ramp that we want to track for this has a slope of 0 0.01 radians per second. So the easiest way to build this is just to do 0 0.01 times the time vector we made. 
So this is a ramp reference signal. And now we have two arguments of the three arguments that we need for LSIM. We have a time vector, we also have an input. Wait, we actually we have all three because we, are all, we also have the closed loop transfer function. So guys, we're ready to, uh, we're ready to simulate. It's easier than you think. All right, so now I'm gonna use LSIM and the first one I wanna look at, ramp response. Lewis asks, why 0 0.01? Go back to the uh, problem statement. We're tracking a reference of 0 0.01 radians per second. All right, the ramp response, I'm gonna use the syntax. It's LSIM of our system transfer function, which is our closed loop. So the output of our closed loop transfer function is the azimuth angle of our antenna. So we're gonna see like, how does our antenna actually move in response to this reference? All right, the second argument is your input. So for us, that's the ramp reference. We're trying that one first. And then our final argument is the time vector. Boom, that's all you have to do. But if you wanna visualize this, obviously you gotta make a figure. And I wanna put two things on here. First, I want to, Jean says, why don't you use element-wise multiplication? Uh, when you multiply a scalar with a vector, don't need element-wise multiplication. So I wanna plot time and my ramp reference, cause that's what I wanna follow. And I'll do that with like, um, let's do some red circles. I might come back and change this in a second. That's okay. Okay, and then the other thing I'm gonna plot is time and my ramp response. And for this one, I'm gonna make it black, also with circles. I'm gonna make the line width two to make this a little thicker. I'm turning on my grid just because I like to see that. I'm labeling my axes like an excellent engineer or scientist. Time in seconds. Y label. So the reference is an azimuth angle. The output is also an azimuth angle. So that, that what we're plotting is an azimuth angle. And so you're imagining this huge structure rotating on its like vertical axis. I'm also gonna put a legend in here because the first thing I plotted was the reference. And then the other one is my output azimuth angle. I think we're ready to run the code. Nine times out of 10, when you run a MATLAB code, you get an error. No error. Beautiful. All right, people. Let me move this legend a little bit because my head is blocking it. The red is the reference that we're trying to track. The black is what the actual antenna is doing. <laughs> we got a comment. If something compiles correctly on the first try, I get very suspicious. That is a good reaction to have. You should be suspicious. All right, what do we see? We see that our antenna is indeed tracking the reference, uh, you, you know, decently. Um, but at the end of 10 seconds, it hasn't precisely settled. You can see like it, it gets nearer, it gets farther, it kind of loses it a little bit, and then it gets nearer, then it gets farther. Why would the response converge to the reference and then begin to diverge? That is um, the oscillations that we're talking about here because it's on the negative real axis. If you have oscillations in your closed loop poles, 
which we do. I mean, our target poles are complex. They have some natural frequency, so they do oscillate. Um, and our third pole also oscillates. Correct. Max says that's transient behavior. That's right. It'll oscillate before it gets to steady state. And that's, that's kind of normal. But after 10 seconds, we know that it should have settled because that was one of our performance requirements. But it looks like it didn't. Maybe I'll increase my final time to like 15 seconds. Let's see if it settles by then. So I'm running it again. Figure popped up again. See now, like after 10 seconds, it looks like there's no more oscillations because we're at steady state. And that steady state error, that's the difference. Maybe we can pick these two points. That's our error, 0.12 minus 0.1185. So this has like 0 0.002 error, which is way better than we need. I think we wanted like 0 0.01 error. So like our KV value had to be greater than one for our steady state error to be satisfied. And our KV value, if you remember, it was like five. So we have like five times better steady state error at least. Okay, so this may not look super problematic to you because I mean, look, it's basically doing its job. Like it does kind of look like it's settled by 10 seconds, but this plot doesn't tell the whole story. There's another thing we, we need to plot, which is the control input. Let's go back to the notes again. Let me pull up my other screen. What we plotted doesn't tell the whole story, ladies and gentlemen. Next thing I want to plot, this is also on homework six. I want you to calculate the control input U. The control input is what comes out of your controller and in this case it is a torque and it's going to be some massive torque to rotate this structure so it's important probably that you try to minimize the amount of input required to save energy now for uh well i'll come back to that so i want to calculate that so how do we do that? U of Z is our controller times the error, E of Z. Now, um, what is E of Z? You might remember we have a closed loop output error transfer function, which we derived. Jean says it looks a little blurry. I hope the stream doesn't look blurry for everybody else. I like how you guys are answering each other's questions in the chat. That's really helpful. Thank you guys. So this is the error and how it's related to the reference. Are you guys still here? I got paranoid after seeing that comment. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in that expression for E of Z, which is one over one plus G Z D Z times R of Z. And what I'm going for here is a transfer function that relates my control input to the reference signal. So I can get U of Z over R of Z is D of Z 
over one plus G of Z, D of Z, okay? And so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this transfer function, which I'm gonna call in MATLAB like G sub U. I'm gonna give this the ramp reference and I wanna see what the control input is gonna be doing to move the antenna. And this is the most disturbing thing about our controller, ladies and gentlemen, so prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Okay. Let's make this transfer function. G sub U. It's going to be D divided by 1 plus G times D. Now these transfer functions D and G, we already defined up above. And I'm gonna throw this command outside of it and you need to do this as well. What min real does, it's, um, it finds the minimum realization. Now don't worry too much about that. Like what, what it does is it simplifies the expression in MATLAB when we multiply these transfer functions together. So now I'm going to use LSIM for that. Let's do ramp control. So this is the control input that's going to be required to create that response we saw earlier. Let's make another figure to visualize what our control input's gonna be. So this time I'm not gonna include the reference. That's not as relevant because our control input isn't gonna track the reference. So it makes no sense to like put that on there. The ramp control. All right guys, I'm gonna show you a different type of plot for this. Instead of plot, I'm gonna use the command stairs. First I'll show you what it looks like and then I'll tell you why I'm doing that. I'm gonna change, I don't really need a legend because I'm only plotting one thing. I'm plotting my control input, which is a, uh, it's a torque, but it's, um, for this model, it's kind of normalized, so it won't be a huge number here. But just keep in mind that the torque that's actually working on the system is humongous. All right, let's see if this works. Can we go two times in a row with no errors? Unreal, unbelievable, we did it. Okay, let's open this up. Looking at this, do you see like any problems, maybe. What's a unique feature of our control input? Huge jumps in positive and negative torques. Yeah. So, Number one, we, you haven't seen any other possible controllers yet. We're going to make a few that are better than this. Uh, but this amplitude is large compared to others. Further, it is boom, 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 oscillating back and forth. And if you've worked with motors before, if you're just reversing the torque over and over again, um, it's a lot of wear and tear. It's a lot of changes in direction. 
So you get like a, a bigger back EMF on there. Uh, so the, the, the idea is, yeah, it produces jerks on the motor. This motor is working really hard. So even if our response from earlier, I mean, it looks, it doesn't look the best, but you might be like, well, it doesn't look that bad. What the motor is doing in the background is obscene. All right, let's simulate the step input because we've done the, oh. Does the flattening of the ramp input to square waves? All right, what I want to answer, uh, or what I want to explain real quick is, why did I use stairs? Which creates this kind of uh, like flattening. When you run a digital controller that only updates every one second, your control input does something we call zero order hold. What it means is you send a control command and then it's that control is held for that one second. So like after one second, our controller says, okay, I need a torque, a normalized torque of 0.2. Okay, and then we hold it for one second until we get an updated one, which is like minus 0.07. And it's probably thinking, what what the heck? I thought you said 0.2. Now you're telling me minus 0.7? Okay. And then it holds that for another one whole second. I smell burning brushes. <laughs> yeah, it's this is not nice to the motor. But when we're doing digital controls, we always use this zero order hold assumption. It's very rare to use anything else. So we hold our control input in between samples. That's why I'm using stairs. I feel like I missed a couple questions. Come to office hours, come hang out. You can always email me as well with questions if I miss something in the chat. And I like how you guys are answering questions as well too. That's really helpful. All right, let's do the, let's do some step responses. So we're gonna do the step response, step control. It seems like for this application, like step references aren't gonna be as common. Like you're gonna be tracking a moving satellite, but let's look at these anyway. I'm gonna copy these two plots and I'm just gonna change it so that it's the step. All right, step reference. Can we do quadratic, Chris says. You're out of control. Do you as the designer choose whether or not to use a step or a ramp, or is that determined by the nature of the plant? What you should, as the control designer should do is you should be using references that are similar to the application you're gonna be working with. And when you define performance, it's usually out of control, pun intended, very much so. Uh, usually we define performance with respect to a step input, so that's that's pretty common too. So you always do like a step to check the performance. All right, step reference. Okay, so now we're gonna check. Yeah, it's important that we do this step so we can see like, remember the performance requirement was overshoot of 16%. That's with respect to a step. We can see if that actually happens. All right, here's our step. And the overshoot actually, wait, is that 16%? 0 0.01, no, no, buddy. That's like 50%, right? That's like 50% overshoot, isn't it? That's bad news. We had a, we had a constraint of 16%. Uh, this is like th three times what it should be. This isn't, this isn't coming from those target poles we chose because we chose those specifically to have like 16%. This is coming from the third troublesome pole. It gave us, yeah, Zoo, that's right. Somebody call the doctor. 
further, uh, you see some of like this jagged, irregular kind of behavior. That's also the rogue pole, also known as a velociraptor, as we know. And uh, you're going to see some of these, like if we zoom in here real tight. And you know the motor's feeling it too. It's like, why are we doing this? There's no reason to do this. I don't want to go back and forth. That's because of that third pole. So we, we, we need to... We need to fix that. Let's see what the, so this is the output of our azimuth angle, by the way. That's the plot that we're looking at. So this is like, I'm telling this huge structure to point itself at 0 0.01 radians. And it kind of goes over there, then it kind of like jitters a little bit, it looks like. Let's look at what the control input had to do. Yeah. You're, tell, you're torquing the motor, boom, 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 boom. To just go point at 0 0.01 radian. That seems unnecessary okay guys so this is how you simulate your closed loop output this is how you simulate uh, what your input is why didn't the zigzag show up in the first plot while tracking the reference Danny I bet they did you know what I'm gonna do Do you know what I'm going to do? What I'm going to do, I'm going to make a variable called ramp error. And what it's going to be is my ramp reference minus my ramp response. So this is my error about that. And I want to, I want to plot it. I want I want to plot it. Ramp error. Uh, we'll do we'll do this. Um, and you know what? I'm not even going to label my axes. So this is the difference between. Let me go back here. I, what I'm the ramp error, I'm subtracting the difference between the red and black line, and then I'm looking at what that looks like. And you know what? It doesn't look as zigzaggy, but I think there's still a little bit. Okay. So. Let's go back to the surface real quick. Are there techniques to improve the additional poles for better performance or to get rid of them? That's what we're going to look at next. Will it perform better in continuous system? Um, I don't think that'll exist in real life. Like for this application, it's controlled digitally. There's no, there's no alternative. Okay. So let's walk this back a little bit. So I'm going to close this out. Just, um, this next part, I'm going to have to get to at 3 PM Eastern time today, but I want to close you out with these thoughts, like a little summary. So we designed a controller by kind of randomly picking uh, one of the controller parameters, which was the zero. Um, maybe I can go back here real quick to Wednesday. Yeah, so we made this controller and we kind of arbitrarily picked this 0 0.5 parameter so the location of the zero and uh, the rest of the parameters we designed around that and it turned out to give us something not very nice and it's hard to just in advance choose something that's going to work nicely so 
as far as I know, there's no way around having to iterate on your control design and just try a bunch of different options and then um, see what works best. So what we're going to do at three is I'm going I'm to show you the way I iterate on control system design. And we're going to end up finding um, a couple controllers that work way better than the one we already found. And it's a good time. Um, this iterative root locus kind of design is going to be what you do on project one. You're going to design a controller for a DC motor. And, um, and this is a DC motor that I have on hand in real life. So we're going to try out the controllers you come up with on that piece of hardware and see if they're any good. I think they will be. Um, so I'm sorry I have to cut this off pretty short right now because I got to get ready for the next lecture. But if you guys can make it back here at 3 p.m. Eastern time, I would love to see you. Yeah, the 334 lecture will be on this channel. We're just catching up with the class, letting them know um, what the rest of the semester is going to look like. So I guess you could come hang out for that too. You're welcome. All right, guys. Adios. Thank you.